All right, why don't we go ahead and get going? Probably a few people that kind of join us uh, as we get through. And uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about some of the unusual skin cancers. I think you guys probably know most everything about basal cell squamous cell, things like that. So I'm not going to hit on that uh, in this talk. But I will talk about some of the unusual kind of cancers that we see um, periodically that you, you need to know a little bit about. Now, we're not going to try to turn you into a cutaneous oncologist here, but uh, these are serious cancers that you may encounter. And, and uh, in fact, if you practice long enough, you probably will encounter one or more of these. Um, and, you know, some of these actually, in some cases, are more deadly than melanoma. Um, there's a lot of different ways these things can kind of differentiate towards neuroendocrine, vascular, fibrohistocytic, et cetera. Um, the clinical features on these things are sometimes kind of weird. They don't look like classic non melanoma skin cancers when you see them, and sometimes the histology is unusual. And one of the reasons that I, I think it's important for you at least to hear about this, uh, my experience is when dermatologists and, and these weird cancers intersect with one another, like a soft tissue neoplasm, for example, the outcome's often problematic. Uh, biopsy may not be taken appropriately. Um, you're not thinking about one of these things. It gets missed, delayed diagnosis, and then, uh, and then we get into problems. So the first one let's talk about is are the neuroendocrine carcinomas. And, and the main one that we see, obviously, is primary Merkel cell. Um, however, we do see secondary uh, neuroendocrine carcinomas that spread to the skin secondarily. And uh, basically, what is the neuroendocrine system? Well, it is a combination of uh, the endocrine system and the nervous system a little bit. And you get this, this, uh, these structures like carcinoid tumors, glucuronomas, things like that that are functioning. And then you get the non-functioning uh, neuroendocrine lesions like Merkel cell and, and small cell carcinoma. But even those actually sometimes can release uh, chemicals. I've heard, you guys probably remember med school, the old Eaton-Lambert syndrome, where patients that have a small cell carcinoma in the lung will get uh, neurologic symptoms because of uh, uh, things that get released by the tumor. So even though they're the functioning and the non-functioning variants, uh, basically they sometimes can function in there as well. So what is a Merkel cell? Well, it's a tactile sensory cell that comes from the neural crest. Uh, they are associated with follicles. And uh, this tumor is usually seen in older individuals, uh, often immunocompromised patients. Uh, I remember having a patient uh, that I had uh, a number of years ago that had renal uh, transplantation and developed it very rapidly, ultimately, ended up, unfortunately, uh, causing his death. And uh, we now know that it's been associated with polyolivirus. We'll talk about that in a few moments. There's several different patterns. We'll talk about that as well. And sometimes this is one of the lesions that can give you pagetoid involvement of the epidermis and occasionally even squamous differentiation. And then the, uh, the, the pattern of the uh, immunoperoxidase, we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's an example of a, neuro, of a uh, Merkel cell in the skin. And these are really used uh, in nature more with, with the animals that use their uh, whiskers to detect things, like cats and dogs, for example. They have uh, lots of Merkel cells associated with those, those whiskers. And so the thing is, when there's movement, uh, you, the cell is, uh, moves and then it, it causes an impulse down this little axon here. So uh, it's very useful. We don't, we don't have as many of these in humans, but in, in, uh, uh, in dogs and cats, they actually use these a lot. And, and some of the other animals that, that do things at night, uh, this is very useful for them to detect where they are in their environment. Um, if you look at these things clinically, they usually, you sort of say, you know, they look like a classic basal cell, but the vast majority of these that we get submitted to us clinically are sent in as rule out basal cell, sometimes squamous cell, sometimes lymphoma, but uh, they're usually not, they don't look like classic skin cancer. You, you sort of know something's wrong with it, but it's, it's not perfect for a basal cell or a squamous cell. Um, these generally tend to have not such a great prognosis. About a third or half of them actually can die. And uh, these things can go deep and get into the subcutaneous fat, fascia, muscle. They don't always con are contiguous with the, the skin. So here's a guy, look, and these are fairly nondescript lesions. I mean, uh, you know, if you see something like that, you might think it's an actinic keratosis or something like that. And that was actually a Merkel cell in this patient. Uh, I think this patient may have had a primary lesion here and then developed all these mets from his Merkel cell and his regional uh, distribution here on his uh, scalp and, and face. 
Uh, and if you look at these under the microscope, basically the classic thing that we're looking for are these small round basophilic cells that can be arranged in sheets, uh, little small nests that can be in trabecula, which are little sort of elongated aggregations. I'll show you that in a moment as well. And this can involve the epidermis. Uh, the individual cells have hyperchromatic nuclei, mitotic figures, apoptosis, and it kind of gives you a smudgy purplish chromatin uh, that I'll show you in a minute. And, basically looks like these other poorly differentiated blue small cell neoplasms. And uh, anytime you see that in the skin, it's sort of a bad sign. Uh, and these things also can look like lymphomas, uh, especially large cell anaplastic type lymphomas. So as we look at this, uh, uh, if you look at the immunohistochemistry, you get this classic paranuclear dot pattern of cytokeratin. That's the classic staining pattern. Uh, they get a positive staining with neuron-specific enolase, synaptophytes, and chromogranin. And then one other marker that we're using now that we really like, that's a nuclear marker, is INSM1, insulinoma 1. And that stains like a SOX10 stain. It stains the nucleus, and it's far better. In fact, in our lab, we don't even use those other stains anymore. We just go straight to the INSM1 and the cytokeratin stains. Um, you also can look for absence of staining uh, for leukocyte common antigen, for example, if you worry about this being a lymphoma, for example, or, or maybe you think it might be a funny melanoma. Obviously, it's not going to stain with this one or the protein or SOX10. Uh, if you are concerned about the metastatic variant, those tend to be positive for TTF1, thyroid transcription factor 1. So we, we look for that. And then if you do an electron microscopic evaluation of this, which you probably don't need to know, but you'll see the, a paranuclear bundle of these intermediate filaments and these uh, neuron neurosecretory granules. So here's another example of a Merkel cell. And again, fairly nonspecific. You, you might think it's obviously a cancer, but probably most people would submit something like that as a lymphoma if they, if they took a biopsy. And here you see the biopsy. This is a small cell variant. So low magnification, very dark blue cells. We always say when something's blue in the skin, it tends to be bad. And uh, here you see the higher magnification, this nondescript basophilic cells here, very many cells per unit area here with this kind of indistinct chromatin. Uh, you may see some nucleoli, but often you don't. You just see this kind of smudgy bluish purple cytoplasm. And uh, again, this is, these cells are relatively small. So this would be the, the so-called small cell variant of this. And uh, here's the synaptophysin stain, which is strongly positive in this case. And then his, this is the classic uh, paranuclear dot pattern, okay? This is beautiful. And this will actually often stain with pan-cytokeratin, but really the one we're really looking for is cytokeratin uh, 20, which is, is positive here. Now this is a little different pattern, uh, so-called intermediate cell Merkel cell carcinoma. So these cells are a little bit larger than the other one. Uh, again, notice this very indistinct, smudgy uh, pattern to the to chromatin here. And uh, there's hyperchromatic nuclei, there's cells that are dying, and, and so this, that's the so-called intermediate variant. And this got a little bit of this so-called trabecular pattern where you get these little struts of collagen uh, between the neoplastic aggregations. Um, this one's got the small cell pattern with the trabecular pattern kind of interspersed. So, uh, Again, small cells here, and you get some of these cells with cords and strands in this thick collagen over here as well. This is a nice example of that so-called trabecular pattern. I don't like that term as much, but basically kind of what it refers to are these cells are in these aggregations that are you know, kind of dissecting between and among the collagen bundles like that. And higher magnification pretty much looks like what we've seen before. Here's the cytokeratin 20 with that paranuclear dot pattern. So, this is, is typical board fodder. I mean, they kind of expect every resident in the world to know this. So make sure you know that neuroendocrine carcinoma, Merkel cell carcinoma, paranuclear dot pattern with cytokeratin 20. So make sure you know that. Very important. Another example, again, this showed you some of the clinical features. These things to be pretty subtle. Uh, this one ulcerated in this case, skin colored, pinkish. Nondescript. I mean, you might think it's a basal cell on bio, uh, clinically. Uh, this one had this more diffuse pattern. Again, notice that trabecular pattern. These cells kind of dissecting diffusely between and among the collagen bundles. Uh, and some people have tried to determine prognosis with these various patterns. Um, I think the latest information is that it sort of doesn't really matter all that much. Uh, if you just get this, obviously, you want to work the patient up. 
make sure that uh, they don't have metastases. And then actually now there's some pretty good biologic agents, some checkpoint inhibitors now that work for this. The classic treatment is excision, uh, radiation therapy, and then checkpoint inhibitor now is, is also available. And so here again is cytokeratin complaint. This got a really small lesion. Again, you see something like this, gosh, can you imagine that that actually turned out to be a Merkel cell? I mean, that, that really is very, very subtle and nonspecific. And this one actually uh, had an example of squamous differentiation, which we see sometimes in Merkel cell, as well as the pagetoid involvement. So that's another board question, is things that give you pagetoid intraepidermal neoplasia and sebaceous carcinoma, melanoma, Paget's disease, extra mammary Paget's disease, mycosis fungoides, pagetoid reticulosis, Langerhans cell histocytosis, and then this. So remember, this one's included in that differential diagnosis also, and you can see it involving the epidermis here. And then here you get the, uh, the Merkel cells, again, with the little aggregations between the collagen bundles here. And uh, this one actually, you can see the, the pagetoid involvement right here overlying it very nicely here. Now, this was a patient that had a really small Merkel cell uh, on his face, was excised, and uh, thought he was going to do well. But then he popped up with uh, a lesion in his parotid gland deep to this. And so uh, that's one of the examples. That's, that's actually the Merkel cell right there, believe it or not. And this is what it looked like on the biopsy. This may have been a little small metastasis from the original uh, Merkel cell. But sometimes these things will give you little tiny uh, little lesions in the skin. They don't all look like these large, diffuse uh, processes. And sometimes they can be pretty small and nonspecific. And here you see that cytokeratin stain pattern again. OK. Um, now, what, what about uh, sitolipid biopsy? Well, a lot of people treat these lesions kind of like melanoma. They excise them, they take out the sitolipid, uh, and then follow it up with radiation therapy. Uh, again, if, uh, if you do sitolipid biopsy, uh, it's, it's often positive, but uh, again, it's, it's sort of think of it sort of like avoiding melanoma. You cut out the, the lymph node. If it's positive, uh, it tends to indicate a worse prognosis than if it's not positive. However, there's some new information now that uh, really you should know about. If you do a biopsy of a Merkel cell and get an answer, you really ought to send the patient's serum off to the University of Washington in Seattle. Uh, and they may be doing this at a few other centers around the United States, but right now they're the, the prime one to do it. They will actually look for the antibody uh, to the polyoma virus, and they can use that to monitor whether the patient is going to get a recurrence. So they say, please do that before you treat the patient definitively because uh, they can follow the antibody titers if they have a positive uh, polyoma virus titer, which, which most of them do. They don't all have it, but if they do have it, it's a useful way to monitor the patients for recurrence. And that's something that uh, a lot of derms don't know about, but it's something that if you get a Merkel cell patient, it's a good idea to do that before you just you know, cut it out and do radiation therapy. So these are the classic differential diagnosis uh, of, of Merkel cell. Lymphoma is probably the most common and probably the most important because the differential, uh, the, the prognosis of a lymphoma is much better than a Merkel cell, especially if it's a large, diffuse lesion. So make sure that when you get this diagnosis, you work it out. And then the other thing that's important is the metastatic neuroepicarcinoma, and those are positive with uh, TTF1. Now, this is something you can just go ahead and they take it to the bank. They're going to ask this on the board somewhere about polyoma virus associated with Merkel cell carcinoma. They may ask you some some second order questions about the incidence of this. Uh, is there any difference in <clears throat> lesions that are uh, polyoma virus versus not? I think the most, to me though, the most important thing is just to know the fact that this is associated with this because it's new and, and uh, some uh, uh, dermatology uh, was involved in the original sort of uh, determination of this. this is Chang and Moore, some of the first guys that found the uh, KS uh, virus and, and uh, HHV8 and, and Kaposi sarcoma. They also found this virus in Merkel cell. They use this interesting technique of digital transcript, uh, transcriptome subtraction, where they kind of took out all the DNA and sort of found what was left, and they found polyoma virus in there. So that's really how this worked. Now, what is a polyoma virus? Well, we're in the middle of a viral pandemic right now, so you should know a little bit about your viruses. Um, the polyoma virus, uh, double strand DNA virus, and it also causes the BK. 
uh, virus and, and Jakob Creutzfeldt disease. So they're included in this uh, polyomavirus family and they cause these diseases, this uh, nephropathy and neuropathy. And it's not a, a good thing to have, obviously. And, and it's also interesting we have associated with trichodysplasia spinulosa, which is not a, a cancer, but it is associated with the same virus in patients that are immunocompromised. So this is what this virus looks like uh, on electron microscopy. And uh, kind of a soccer ball there, like you see over here. Okay, so that's the uh, polyomavirus, and just remember that. And now uh, there is a, a new biologic agent that we're using for uh, Merkel cell now uh, uh, that works analogous to Opdivo and squamous cell and, and some of these other kind of cancers. Now, what about metastatic small cell carcinoma? Well, this can histologically look very, very similar to uh, primary Merkel cell carcinoma. You got the same cells, they're neuroendocrine cells. Uh, usually you don't get any epidermal involvement and you do not get pagetoid involvement with this, uh, but it shows pretty much the same thing. Atypical cells, they're smudgy chromatin, they're basophilic, apoptotic cells with mitotic figures, you get the same kind of staining pattern. However, this is more commonly positive with thyroid transcription factor one and more commonly negative for cytokeratin 20. So that's a helpful finding. So this guy, had this lesion that uh, popped up on his eyelid over here. Uh, he had a known underlying uh, small cell carcinoma of the lung and developed this lesion. And here's what his tumor looked like when they uh, took a biopsy. It looks very much like a primary Merkel cell carcinoma. Uh, so it's got the same pattern, same cells, everything looks the same. So again, you'd say, well, okay, that looks like an early carcinoma. However, this one was positive diffusely for TTF1 and uh, his workup showed presence of the lesion in his lung that spread to the skin secondarily. So uh, it's a helpful stain when you get this, uh, especially if the site of keratin 20 stain is negative. Uh, so that's one way you can distinguish between these two. Now, one other question that often comes up because Merkel cell carcinoma tends to metastasize, how can you tell the difference between a metastatic lesion from the internal part of the body that goes to the skin versus a Merkel cell that, that goes to the lung, for example? And it can be sometimes difficult to do. Uh, once again, the TF1 is commonly positive in that, and the side of character 20 more commonly positive. So uh, but at the end of the day, if they've got metastatic disease, you're going to treat them pretty much the same with these drugs and, and excision and, and, uh, and radiotherapy. OK, let's switch gears. Let's talk about a couple of soft tissue neoplasms, DFSP. This is the most common, probably, soft tissue neoplasm that we deal with. In, uh, in dermatology. Uh, so we see uh, atypical fibrosanthoma and, and now pleomorphic dermal sarcoma. And, uh, that's actually a, in a different talk, so I'll give you one a talk on that at some point in the future. But uh, this, this one is the one that we see most commonly that's really a true soft tissue neoplasm. And uh, there can be a lot of different clinical morphologies. It can be a multinodular lesion, which is the classic one. You can sometimes get a subcutaneous tumor, you get atrophic plaque. And when you look at the microscope, the, the classic form is a diffuse proliferation of spindle cells with these fascicles that interweave in the store form pattern. But there are some other patterns. And uh, you can sometimes give you a mixoid pattern that can look like a mixoid neurofibroma. That still stains with CD34, um, generally more diffuse than a neurofibroma. They give you so, that so-called sort of thumbprint pattern that's kind of weak. Uh, and then uh, you can get some slight S100 protein staining in that too. So they can be sometimes difficult to distinguish and you really make sure that you get a, a good deep biopsy to distinguish that. And then the Bednar tumor is basically a DFSP in which you can get some melanocytes in there. And it can sometimes be confused with a variant of the blue nevus or desoplastic melanoma, but it tends to have more of the diffuse spindle cell pattern as well with, with, uh, with a, a more cellular than, than those other lesions. And I, I may have an example of that in the lecture as well. The classic uh, pattern is CD34 positive staining with factor 13A negative staining. But you really, that this thing really does not look much like a dermatofibroma in the microscope. So here's some clinical patterns. Here's the classic multi-nodular pattern that we talk about. Uh, but this one was just one large giant nodule. Um, this was in a baby and had this little small little plaque here that's kind of atrophic. And this person had had it for a long time, developed this atrophic plaque that looked like an anidoderma. So these things don't always look like this. They can have multiple different histologic and uh, clinical patterns. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the classic diffuse pattern. 
uh, and it's a punch biopsy, shows involvement of the subcutaneous fat here in the so-called honeycomb pattern. I'll show you that in, in another example in a minute. And it's got this diffuse proliferation of these spindle-shaped cells that have this little interweaving basket weave storiform pattern to it and goes down into the subcutaneous fat and it just dissects between the lipocytes. It's very helpful when you see that, that pattern. So here you've got the, the cells in the storiform pattern. You don't have the thick keloidal collagen bundles like you see in the dermatophyte fibroma. You don't get hemocytorin in this lesion. You don't get much inflammation in this lesion. And so here you see it again in another location here. So these are kind of S-shaped spindle cells here forming these little fascicles here that interweave like over here. Basket we pattern. And here you see it going all the way down to the subcutaneous fat where it's kind of dissecting between the individual lipocytes. But you do not see that in dermatophyte fibroma. Here's another pattern. And this was actually from one of those little children that I showed you before. And look how diffuse and deep this thing goes. Even though it's a punch biopsy, this thing goes all the way down to the base. So here's this so-called honeycomb pattern. That's just almost pathognomonic for DFSP. So you really want to get into the fat to look for this pattern. If you see it, nothing else really does this. You don't need a stain. You don't need any all that stuff. You can do it if you want to. But if you see this pattern, you should be able to make the diagnosis of DFSP. Here's the CD34 pattern. Now, CD34 with DFSP is diffuse and strong. Uh, it's, it's all over the place. So it's not just patchy. It's not just a little thumbprint pattern. I mean, this, this thing is strongly, strongly positive for CD34. Um, here was an example of a lady that actually had a lesion on her arm and just sent in routine biopsy, shave biopsy, showed this very myxoid lesion here. Okay, so, and, and one of the problems, when I say that soft tissue neoplasms and, and dermatology don't like one another very well is because as derms, we don't usually do incisional biopsies, excisional biopsies on, on day one. Surgeons, they'll, they'll, they'll slice out something the size of you know, a piece of pie on, a, on an office visit, but dermatologists don't do that. They, we like to, we see a lot of patients scheduled and so we have to do shade biopsies. And, and so consequently, we may get a sampling here. And these soft tissue neoplasms, they can be multiphasic. You hear things called biphasic, triphasic, when one area it may show a myxoid, another area may show a diffuse spindle cell component, and another area may show a melanocytic uh, component. So if you just do a shave, you may get something like this. It looks a lot like a neurofibroma. So this is a subtle myxoid pattern. You don't see any fascicles of spindle cells interwe interweaving here. Um, this is very bland and, and to die, you wouldn't, no one would call this a straightforward DFSP just looking at this. It would be in the differential diagnosis possibly, but it wouldn't be just, oh gosh, it's a classic DFSP. Okay, so it, it stayed there. They didn't get the diagnosis. In fact, they got diagnosis of neurofibroma, came back, did another biopsy, and they shaved it again. And so it shows a little different pattern now. Now it's got more cellularity to it. It does have some of these spindle cells that are in a weaving. And now it doesn't really look like a neurofibroma here. So this is not a classic pattern for neurofibroma. Maybe over here, you might say maybe, but not over here. This doesn't look like it at all. So, but it was still called a neurofibroma, unfortunately. So the diagnosis got delayed even further. And then finally, somebody worked it up, did CD34, was strongly positive, and then at the end of the day, they actually finally got a diagnosis. So uh, just remember, these things don't always look classic clinically or histologically. Uh, they're prone to multiple occurrences. The best treatment of choice here is Mohs, but Gleevec actually can be used. Uh, and actually what, what you can use Gleevec for is maybe to decrease the original size of the tumor and then do Mohs around that. So hopefully maybe it can decrease the size of your surgery but you still have to follow the patients up because sometimes they recur even after Mohs surgery. So, uh, but remember that you really want to get a good deep incisional biopsy of these lesions if you can. Now the board probably is going to get into a lot of uh, molecular pathology gene information, but if they do, this may be the one situation where they actually ask you a question about it. And basically this does have a cytogenetic hallmark of an extra ring chromosome uh, from uh, chromosome 17 and 22, and so sometimes you get a 17 to 22 translocation. And what actually happens here is that you get a rearrangement between this collagen A1 gene on the gene 17 to the platelet-derived growth factor beta chain on, on chromosome 21. And when you get these things that fuse together, it releases the expression of this platelet-derived uh, growth factor beta, which upregulates tyrosine kinase, which promotes growth, 
and that's how these lesions actually grow. So there's a cytogenetic reason for this tumor actually occurring. And uh, it's not a, uh, a germline mutation. This is obviously a somatic mutation, but actually this is the way that it works. And so if you give uh, Gleevec or imatinib, it actually targets this site and it actually decreases this platelet-derived growth factor beta expression and, and leads to decrease of the uh, tyrosine kinase. So it actually can be useful to decrease the size of these tumors. So this is kind of the, the, uh, the chromosome, if you will, looking at it, and it basically kind of shows a translocation, how that works. And so that's uh, basically uh, an interesting finding. And this was a patient that actually had got Gleevec. So he actually got the Gleevec, his lesion got smaller, and then they actually were able to go in and do Mohs and sort of decrease it. So this, I've got this slide in here. You can look at it if you want to, but I really don't think you're going to get too terribly many questions about this. If you do, the only other one that you probably ought to at least know about maybe briefly is this uh, clear cell soft part sarcoma, which a lot of people think is a, a variant of a uh, malignant melanoma. It has a Ewing sarcoma uh, gene abnormality here, translocation. So that's probably the only other one that you really need to know. Uh, but I would know that briefly at least a little bit about this uh, collagen A uh, translocation in, uh, with the tyrosine kinase in um, DFSB. Okay, let's move on and talk a little bit about angiosarcoma. Okay, this is also important to us from a clinical perspective. And, and this, you're probably going to get a question or two about this on the board because it's important to know about. Um, there's really two main types that we see in dermatology. The most common is the purpuric black ugly looking lesion on somebody's face or scalp of an older person. Uh, you can get other variants, however, uh, nodules, ulcerated lesions, and then you can get the Stuart Treves variant that's due to lymphedema. Uh, often uh, somebody, let's say maybe a lady's had uh, breast surgery, uh, in the old days they get the radical mastectomy, they get lymphedema in their arm, and they get a Stuart Treves angiosarcoma usually on the arm in that situation. So again, these are the most common variants. You can actually get uh, radiation can induce these, uh, relatively uncommon, but can happen. And then uh, histologically, well, you can sometimes see epithelioid angels, we'll talk about a couple of those. This would be the, the so-called Wilson-Jones variant. And this is such a tragic uh, situation when somebody gets this. I mean, uh, this, this entire guy's uh, whole scalp and face, uh, the lady actually, um, is involved with this lesion. So all of this is involved. In, there's just not much you can do here. I uh, try radiation therapy, and this is not a good location to get one either. You can imagine the kind of mutilating process that, that surgery they're going to have on that. Um, another example. So again, this is this is a terrible disease. Um, actually, one one thing that a lot of the radiotherapy uh, radiation oncology is doing is using brachytherapy. They kind of create a uh, kind of a uh, cap, if you will. They cover the whole scalp, and they they put these thorium rods in there. Um, that kind of sometimes helps to kind of, it's really more of a palliative therapy, actually. And when you look at it under the microscope, you see, again, it depends on which stage of this that you get. So you can get a very uh, well-differentiated lesion, it can be really subtle. You can get a very poorly differentiated lesion, it can look like a spinal cell neoplasm. But the classic form is you see the diffuse proliferation of these staghorn irregular blood vessels that have these large atypical endothelial cells that are falling freely into the space of these vessels. And they're atypical with mitotic figures and whatnot. So I'll show you some examples of those in a minute. Uh, positive staining with, with these markers, CD31, CD34. Uh, there's another marker that's new now, ERG, ERG. I don't know if they'll ask you that or not, probably not, but at least I'll be aware of it. And then sometimes these can look like some of the other vascular neoplasms. I don't generally find these to be too tough to tell under the microscope. So again, let's take a look at, at some examples of these. Probably the one that's the most serious, the most dangerous of all because it gets misdiagnosed is the well-differentiated angiosarcoma. So here, we've got a shave biopsy, once again, um, shave biopsy plus soft tissue neoplasm, bad outcome, and I've seen misdiagnoses on this multiple times where a derm does a shave on it and it's an angiosarcoma and they send it in as rule out melanoma or rule out uh, pygenic granuloma, and it doesn't get diagnosed as an angiosarcoma because they don't really get the most obvious diagnostic areas. If you see a well-differentiated angiosarcoma, I mean, look at this. It's got these very small blood vessels here. They're not strikingly atypical. There's too many per unit area, and they're irregular in size and shape. 
So you really have to have a high index of sufficient. This doesn't have a lot of the atypical endothelial cells, doesn't have the cells falling into the lumen that I'll show you in a minute. So thank goodness there was a guardian angel looking over the shoulder of the dermatologist that took the biopsy that this was suspected as being an angiosarcoma. And if, we, if I saw this, I would probably not just call it straightforward angiosarcoma. I would probably say something like, atypical vascular proliferation, and I would recommend another biopsy. So I'd make you go back and take a deep incisional biopsy here. We don't want to uh, basically give someone a, a horrible diagnosis on a small biopsy like this. So, so we want to correlate this with clinical and make you take another deeper biopsy. You know, so this is, this is one that shave is, is not a good technique to do. So here's another example. So just look how subtle this is. Very, very difficult. So you're, you're prone to make a mistake, on something like this, on a shade bias. So it's just, it can be, a, it's, it's a, a dangerous situation here. So it, it is cancer, I mean, there's an atypical cell right there, and we would, you know, in retrospect, yeah, this is a well differentiated angiosarcoma, but would you make this diagnosis on a shade biopsy? It's probably really not medically reasonable to do it. You really want to get a more, diff a more larger biopsy that proves it. Now, sometimes they become a little bit uh, more, so this is not a well-differentiated, it's more of a moderately differentiated lesion, so we can still make the diagnosis. And this is what we like to see, staghorn, irregular blood vessels, and notice, this is a, an incisional biopsy, good, large, deep incisional biopsy here. So when you're dealing with soft tissue, take out the knife and fork. You're going to have to do a deep biopsy, large biopsy. So here we get the irregular staghorn blood vessels. The, the individual cells comprising these blood vessels are atypical, I'll show you that higher magnification. Uh, these are atypical endothelial cells with way too many cells per unit area. And then in some areas, you may even see a few of the cells beginning to kind of fall freely into the lumen over here. So this is a more moderately differentiated angiosarcoma. Mitotic figure here. Um, so again, these are, you see some of the irregular blood vessels in the background over here. And another example, Hansel and Fluos here, these things are dissecting <clears throat> between the, uh, the collagen. And then sometimes the lesions just get very, very poorly differentiated. And this one is, uh, gosh, you know, you can still make it out as it's vascular over here, but these cells are so poorly differentiated, I mean, it's hard to really determine that they're blood vessels. This is CD31 highlighting all the blood vessels, proving that it's vascular. Um, and this is an epithelioid angiosarcoma, and these can look Whenever we say something is epithelioid, it means it looks like an epithelium. So it's not epithelial, but it looks like epithelium under the microscope because the cells get closely packed with one another. They kind of look like squamous cells. They're hugging each other. But this is an avascular lesion. And it's positive again with vascular markers. Sometimes they actually can express cytokeratin as well. And they can simulate other epithelioid neoplasms. We'll talk about epithelioid sarcoma in a minute. But anyway, it can look a lot like other uh, epithelial neoplasms. Here's an example of one of these. Again, notice the biopsy. So again, a good, large, deep excisional or incisional biopsy here. And uh, again, if you just look at this, gosh, this could be squamous cell here. So it's, it looks like an epithelium, but it's not epithelium. It actually turns out to be vascular, and, and maybe these are some vascular spaces in here that are just kind of chocked. Basically, they've pretty much just been destroyed because all the cells have proliferated so much, they're just pushing out all the, the residual blood vessels. And again, this is CD31, a vascular marker, diffusely and strongly positive. So not uh, an epithelial neoplasm. It looked epithelial, but it wasn't. Here's another example. Again, nodule, the bruise-like morphology off to the side, which is a clue to the diagnosis. This was a tragic situation. This was a gentleman, young guy, 46 year old developed this new plaque on his face here, pretty subtle. I mean, it almost looks like rosacea. I mean, would you really think that's an angiosarcoma? I mean, it come up relatively quickly. It uh, got worse with heat uh, when his head was, was uh, put below his feet in a Trendelenburg position. This thing actually would sort of light up. Okay, the head tilt maneuver. We actually wrote this up a number of years ago in the archives of dermatology. So this is before and after his head tilt. Look how bright red that thing would get when you put him in that Trendelenburg position. So that's something to, to think about actually that you can use to highlight the extent of an angiosarcoma if you're dealing with a patient that's got it. So anyway, they took multiple punch biopsies of this thing and here was the diagnosis. And you can see 
Um, it's got, again, these staghorn irregular blood vessels diffusely present uh, in his dermis here. And uh, these are very irregular, jagged, bizarre shaped blood vessels. So we were able to make a diagnosis definitively in this case. And then this lesion at this point in time was still relatively well differentiated. So it hadn't really become more poorly differentiated yet. He got radiation therapy, um, didn't work very well, unfortunately. Also got uh, paclitaxel, which uh, you know gave him some benefit, but then he started getting recurrences. You can see he's still a really young guy, but look how much he's aged in the picture just from the treatment of this. And then this thing unfortunately developed a more poorly differentiated uh, lesion. And on biopsy of that, it was more of a, a solid rather than that, that more dissecting vascular pattern. So just remember, you really need to get a good bias here. This was a lesion we had not too long ago. 68 year old guy with a 68 year, uh, 68 year old guy with a verrucous plaque on his scalp. Sent in as just rule out cancer and superficial shave biopsy. Just kind of barely got into it once again. So again, beware of, of shave biopsies of these things. I mean, you're going to see lesions that you don't think are these non uh, melanoma skin cancers that are aggressive. And they're going to fool you sometimes. I've seen lesions rule out melanoma that turn out to be angiosarcoma. I've seen squamous cell um, you know, rule out melanoma. I saw, I saw a case when I first came into practice in Dallas years ago. Most surgeon um, was submitted for uh, to, to excise a squamous cell, and he started excising. He started looking at it under his frozen sections. You know, this doesn't look like a classic squamous cell. Would you drive that to my my office and look at the frozen sections, which I did. He had an epithelial angiosarcoma that had been called a squamous cell, and the most surgery was the Mohs on it, and he couldn't get it cleared. So obviously, uh, be careful of this situation. So here you see the endothelial cells floating freely in the space. We were able to make the diagnosis on that, and then this is the clinical picture of that lesion. So it didn't look like the typical angiosarcoma. Look, this one didn't have any color to it. So these things don't always look pink and purple. So just beware of these and just realize that you can be fooled. You don't want to just, get, if, if you get fooled, a lot of times we're fooled. So uh, you make better chance one of these things if you get, if it doesn't look classic, think about taking a deeper, broader picture. You know, this doesn't look like a classic basal cell or squamous cell. I'm not just going to do a superficial shave. I'm going to do maybe an incisional biopsy in that situation. Okay, let's talk a little bit about this lesion, epithelial and sarcoma. And this is important also because this is uh, the most important uh, soft tissue tumor in young people that's malignant, uh, often in people in their 20s and 30s. There's two types. There's an, a distal type that involves the, the hands, the arm, and, uh, and this is the, and also there's another type that occurs in the pelvic area. The ones that we get concerned about dermatology is this more distal type. Um, they can present as a small ulcerating nodule, um, and then the microscope can be confusing as well, so we'll talk a little bit about that. Okay, who in their right mind would ever think of a soft tissue sarcoma when looking at this lesion. I mean, it looks like a small ulcerated nodule. Uh, again, could be like a rule out basal cell, something like that. No one would think of, of a sarcoma in this situation. Uh, this was uh, the lesion, I think, after a biopsy. And if you look at some of the microscope, again, this also can give you a, a biphasic, multiphasic appearance. Um, it can look like a, a palisaded granulomatous dermatitis, and that's probably the most important histologic thing to remember because you get a central necrosis of the tumor and it, you've got the tumor cells at the periphery and it looks like GA or something like that, but it's not. And we'll, I'll show you an example of that uh, in just a minute. Uh, and the individual cells, again, can look like squamous cells. It's epithelioid, again, and it can also look like epithelioid histiocytes. But this classically stains positive with both cytokeratin and bimentin. It's, it's been called the, the soft tissue carcinoma by some people because it does actually have cytokeratin positivity. So here's an example, punch biopsy. Doesn't really look like a, an aggressive tumor at low power. It looks a lot like granulomanulari. It's got these cells that are present diffusely between the collagen bubbles. It almost has this palisaded granuloma looking like pattern here. But actually what's happening is, is the tumor is undergoing necrosis centrally. These cells are atypical, they're epithelioid, so they're not really histiocytes here. There's no mucin. Uh, you basically just kind of got tumor necrosis centrally that's surrounded by these cells over here. And this can be very subtle, very confusing. I've seen this diagnosis missed many times. I've seen lawsuits over this, so it's all sort, it's a problem. Um, 
you know, obviously you don't want to make them miss a diagnosis in a young individual because uh, if it goes undetected for a year or two or whatever and then they get metastases in their lung and other things, well, then it's just really a disaster. This cell is atypical. Um, you've got a hypochromatic cell here. So if you saw this, you say, this doesn't look like a typical granulomatous dermatitis, and you, may, you should at least think about the diagnosis. So here's the cytokeratin stain, and it's positive. And notice it, it almost looks like a, a palisaded pattern here. Here it is down here in the deep dermis and the subcutaneous fat area also. So this was a uh, cytokeratin positivity of this soft tissue tumor here, and it also was diffusely and strongly positive for bimentin. So bimentin and cytokeratin epitheliaid sarcoma. Here's another more classic pattern. Um, he had the primary lesion down here and got this uh, metastases, lymphangitic spread going proximal here. Every one of these was, was this epithelioid sarcoma. Here's another example. And again, something like this, it's firm, it's a plaque, it's nondescript. Think about something weird and don't just do a shave on this. If you shave this, you may not get any diagnosis. They, they come back as a scar, they come back as chronic inflammation. So again, a, a deep incisional or maybe a six millimeter punch, but do something that's gonna get into the dermis here also. This was a young kid that actually had epithelial sarcoma of his, uh, of his finger. He was like in his teens and had this. And uh, again, you know something's atypical when you see something like this. It's, this isn't a typical uh, skin neoplasm. And this is what his lesion looked like, a more solid uh, soft tissue neoplasm here. Again, looking very epithelioid. So it almost looks like squamous cell, but it actually turns out to be uh, a soft tissue neoplasm that's got this epithelioid morphology that happens to express both cytokeratin and bimentin. So again, these are some other lesions that can be epithelioid under the microscope, hemangiomas, angiosarcomas, leiomyosarcomas, schwannomas, melanomas. So just remember this, this concept of epithelioid neoplasms. So the last one I'm going to show you is, is, is just a, a sarcoma. Again, we don't get too many of these in dermatology, but please, if you get something like this, um, don't just take a shave of it. You know? And also, don't let it go without biopsying. I had a, sort of a, a tragic case of a, of a friend of mine that actually had a, a, a friend of, of hers was seeing her and started getting this sort of indurated area on her calf, and it looked like a lipoma. And, so basically said, well, you know, probably nothing to worry about. Eventually, the patient was referred for liposuction for lipoma. Turned out it was this unusual myxoid uh, fibrosarcoma that simulated a lipoma. It ended up in a lawsuit. It was a horrible, tragic situation. But, you know, these things, we don't see these things as dermatologists. So it's not really in our wheelhouse to think about something like this. It only looked like a lipoma clinically. They, they often don't look like anything too seriously. So again, just beware of this. Uh, this lesion you wouldn't think would be a liposarcoma. And this, this thing, obviously, something's going on here. There's, there's all this induration, scar tissue and whatnot. This actually been previously biopsied and actually recurred at the site. So again, something like this, please. Uh, if you're going to do use a scalpel here, turn it 90 degrees. <laughs> don't. This isn't a tangential type biopsy. You got to take something that's going to be like a wedge out of this thing. If you don't feel comfortable doing it, send them to a surgeon. You know. It, it, if you don't have time to do it, uh, just send it to somebody that, that's, that's, that's they're, they're comfortable taking biopsies of this. So you do not want to do a shave biopsy on something like this. It's just not going to show you anything. And then sometimes remember the imaging. Um, we tend to forget about x-rays in dermatology, but uh, good rule of thumb, if you've got something like this, take an imaging study before you do the biopsy. Get a sense for how deep it goes. Um, so, hey, you know, I'm going to need to take a, a big deep incisional biopsy to get into this, this thing. Uh, and same thing with nail unit biopsies. Take an x-ray there before you do a nail unit biopsy. That's very helpful and give you an idea before what's, what's going on. If you look at this under the microscope, it classically shows a spindle cell neoplasm with variable pleomorphism. And sometimes the pleomorphism is kind of subtle in this lesion. It isn't always just strikingly atypical with very atypical cells. Um, often it is, but it doesn't have to be. And once again, these things can be multiphasic. So you need a deep biopsy to look for different areas. So here's an example. You can see it's a deep six millimeter punch probably or four millimeter punch. So we got deep into the lesion. I'd rather have a punch than a shave, obviously. If you did a shave at the top, it's not gonna show anything. But down here you see all this myxoid morphology. Now, things that are blue in derm tend to be bad. 
things that have a lot of mucin in them often are bad in dermatology. So if you get a neoplasm, a lot of mucin, it doesn't have to be bad. I mean, you get mixoid neurofibromas and schwannomas, and that doesn't mean anything. You can get cutaneous mixomas. But these lesions, if there's mixoid morphology, or mixoid lipoma, it can be like a mixoid liposarcoma or mixoid fibrosarcoma. So you start looking for lipoblast, you start looking for these atypical pleomorphic cells that mix with all this mucin. And so this is one of the reasons that we like to get a deeper biopsy because we're looking for architecture, not just cytology. If you just have a field like this, you probably can't make the diagnosis. I mean, this really looks more just like a cutaneous mixoma. You might get a little worried about one or two of these cells that are atypical, but something like this, we probably say, make sure this isn't a sampling error, make sure it's not a, a mixoid aggressive tumor that's just sampled a non-aggressive area. Here we've got a very bizarre cell with four or five nuclei in it. Uh, that's got some hyperchromaticity. So something like this, we're going to be very concerned about this. We might raise the diagnosis with you. And once again, we might recommend that you go back and take a, a more uh, in excisional biopsy. Now, this lesion used to be called the old days mixoid malignant fibrocytocytoma. They, a lot of guys aren't using that term anymore. In the old days, it might have been called a mixoid liposarcoma. But basically, it's a malignant soft tissue neoplasm with this mixoid morphology. And some of these can be very low grade, like that lesion I just showed you a minute ago. Uh, if you don't really get a, a deep incisional biopsy, you just may not be able to make the diagnosis. Uh, a lot of the soft tissue people are sending these off for these uh, chromosome abnormalities to search for these translocations. So again, if you're not sure, that's something that often gets done in, in, this, in, that, uh, in, this, in the soft tissue sarcoma world. Um, these are other lesions in the mixoid differential diagnosis that you need to be aware of. So just remember, um, these lesions don't always look atypical. You need an incisional or deep biopsy to look for that atypical area. Here's another example. Uh, again, pretty nonspecific on a clinical basis. Here's the microscopic. This one's got a lot of atypical cells in it. So again, here, uh, you would certainly make the diagnosis of a malignant mixoid neoplasm, whether this is a mixoid liposarcoma or a mixoid fibrosarcoma. It, it's sort of I don't care as much. I just want to make sure that I'm getting the diagnosis of malignant mixoid neoplasm, that I've been given an appropriate biopsy for diagnosis. And something like this, you know, is malignant here. So this is good when you see this kind of thing. This lesion actually was called a mixoid liposarcoma. Again, I think today we, it might be called, you know, one of these other mixoid neoplasms are kind of the soft tissue guys change the, 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 the terminology every few years. But nevertheless, uh, this is, the, without question, a, a mixoid malignant neoplasm. And here you see a staining pattern was highlighting some of the uh, cells. I think this was a, a CD68, was highlighting the fibrohistocytic uh, nature of that lesion. Another example, something like this, obviously, you're going to want to take a deep biopsy. This thing is poorly differentiated. And when something is, gets this poorly differentiated, I think it was just a poorly differentiated uh, mixoid fibrosarcoma in this situation. And again, you can see this thing has just got very, very atypical cells, poorly differentiated with this mixoid morphology to it. So in conclusion, um, we see some of these every now and then in dermatology. It's not uh, too terribly common, but just remember that they're out there. Um, you're kind of just cruising along, taking biopsies of nevi and, and basal cells and squamous cells and all this kind of stuff. And boom, suddenly you, you hit one of these lesions um, and uh, just remember to take a biopsy that's going to make sure that you pick it up. Uh, if it's uh, that, that you're just not going to leave something in that by a shade biopsy just comes back as, as a nondescript diagnosis. So if it doesn't look classic, think about taking an incisional biopsy or at the very least a deep punch and consider doing imaging studies before you take a biopsy one of these patients. Okay, great. Well, thank you guys again for uh, your attendance and. Um, Again, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, send us an email or text. 